Neckties have been an essential component of the male business dress for over a century. But what is a tie? Where do ties come from? The origin of ties starts with the decorative history of shirts. Think of Albrecht Dürer and his pouty lips and smooth hairless chest over a voluminous, finely pleated smock. This shirt would have been made out of very fine and therefore costly linen, gathered up into a decorated band of embroidery. The pleated neckline moved higher and higher up the body until it sat right at the neck, and then the embroidered band shifted down the fabric to create a little ruffle out of all those pleats. The word ruffle may sound pretty girly to a modern man, but when we think feminine in the context of fashion, what we really mean is impractical, which used to be code for I'm rich. So all this ostentatious use of fabric was, of course, a clear sign of your impressive economic standing. The little ruffle detached from the shirt to become a separate piece called a ruff. Ruffs were made of strips of linen gathered up and sewn to a short, flat band. Heavily starched, they were often trimmed with lace or edged with metallic thread. The starch would have been extracted from wheat by the launderers, boiled into a paste, and then slathered across both sides of the fabric before being molded over a shaped stick and dried before a fire. Before you laugh at guys in old portraits, remember that at the time, wearing lace didn't mean you were any less of a man's man. It was more like wearing a Rolex or driving an Aston Martin. All of the weaving, sewing, and embroidery that went into the making of the ruffs was done entirely by hand, including making or tatting lace. It wouldn't have just been purchased by the yard, it would have been custom made specifically for whatever it was sewn to. If you were particularly wealthy or important, special decorations might be incorporated, like rearing lions or fleur-de-lis. The modern equivalent of this is perhaps the luxury suiting fabrics where you can have your initials woven into the pinstripes. So by 1530, if you're a guy worthy of respect, you're wearing a ruff. And if you're a sensitive, brooding guy, you might even be pulling it off with a modicum of self-respect. It's not going to be comfortable. Comfort in clothing hasn't been invented yet. Practicality is for laborers. This ridiculousness of vanity wasn't only apparent in hindsight. There were plenty of detractors at the time declaring ruffs absurd, if not downright works of evil. The 16th century English diarist Philip Stubbs called ruffs cartwheels of the devil's chariot of pride, leading the direct way to the dungeon of hell. Rumor had it, Ruffs also helped prevent plague-ridden fleas from jumping from one's head onto one's body. By the 1600s, ruffs were on their way out of fashion in most of Europe, but there were some that kept the dream alive well past its due date. Calvinist burghers of the Netherlands were still wearing ruffs well into the 1660s. At one point, they got so large they couldn't reach their forks around to their mouths and had to have their servants spoon-feed them. Some kept the pleated fullness of the ruff, but left out the stiff starch, which is why those somber men in Rembrandt paintings may make you think of the circus, since that's where clown collars derive from. Or, if you lost the ruffly fullness, but kept the starched width, you got the whisk, which gave one that classy head-on-a-platter look, noted by a character in Ben Jonson's The Alchemist. Whisks look kind of like a cross between a Velasquez-y alien invasion from a 1950s sci-fi movie and a plastic dog collar. Without changing the shape of the whisk, if you eliminated the starch, you were left with a cavalier falling collar, which was all the rage with those three musketeers. The short hairstyles of the 1500s descended along with the neckwear until the fashion was for thick, curly, shoulder-length hair with bangs. Very mid-90s supermodel hair. Since these gentlemen probably only washed their hair once or twice a year, those collars would likely have been pretty dirty. The following shrinking of the collar may not have been unrelated to the difficulty of keeping that expensive linen and lace sparkling white, especially as the fashion for hair grows longer and longer with the massive wigs made popular by the early balding Louis XIII. The lacy collars were split down the front in an upside-down V. The bottom points of the V were then drawn back together with two tube-like folds that ran parallel down the front from under the chin, sometimes seen with the dangling tassels used to tie the collar together. Those two rolls will eventually flatten out and the collar behind it shrink up into a simple band known as the robot collar or falling band. 
it only remains fashionable for a brief period before finding a permanent home as part of the uniform for Protestant ministers and English magistrates, but it was the key moment of transition from a round collar to a long, rectangular, scarf-like accessory. These were called cravats after the Croatian mercenary soldiers hired to assist the French against the Habsburg Empire. One new style originated in Flanders at the Battle of Steenkirk in 1692. According to popular legend, the soldiers were surprised with one early morning attack, and to keep their neckwear from flapping about in a strong breeze and getting in the way of serious fighting, they shoved their scarves through the buttonholes of their coats. Thus, the fashion for the Steinkirk tie began and remained popular for nearly a hundred years. The cravat traveled from France to England with Charles II, and from England voyaged with the pilgrims to America. But since the Puritans had outlawed having fun of any kind, it will be a while before we can look to America for fashion inspiration. Back in France, the cravat became more delicate and flamboyant and was called the jabot after a bird's craw, which is a pouch in the digestive tract below the throat. The jabot was a strip of linen trimmed with lace, and they were often the most expensive item in your entire wardrobe. Every morning, the royal cravatier would present Louis XIV with a basket full of lace cravats decorated with colorful ribbons. The king made his choice and began his knot, leaving the finishing touches to the dutiful and much-envied attendant. Wearers were forced to remain erect and keep their chins up all day. Perhaps that nose-in-the-air snootiness we associate with the upper class is simply a result of their uncomfortable neckwear. Before lace disappeared from men's fashion completely, it moved from the jabot to down the front of the shirt, looking like the ruffled tuck shirts of the 1970s. It became fashionable to leave the first few buttons of your jacket open in order to display some of your elaborately frilled shirt. With the decorative focus shifted to down the front, neck scarf shrunk in size, and the bow under the chin shifted around to the back of the neck. Fashions of the time involved powdered wigs, and as they tended to shed flour all over your finery, were pulled back into ponytails called cues, and were kept neat in bags made of black satin and tied with a ribbon. Unbelievable as it may seem, men did wear their ponytails tucked into little silk purses. Sometimes the ribbon was extra long and wrapped back around the neck and tied under the chin on top of a strip of starched muslin called a stock, which had evolved from the jabot and been made popular by the armies of the French and Germans. The military is often a big influence on fashion, and young civilian men started wearing this rigid neckwear as a sign of patriotism. The collars were worn so tight that they stressed the larynx and caused not only considerable discomfort, but strained voices, dizziness, and sometimes fainting. The tension made the eyeballs bulge out a bit, and the resultant ruddy glow of the face made the style popular among officers as a way of announcing the health and vigor of their infantry, presuming one didn't faint, I assume. After the French Revolution, the jabot went out of fashion because it was associated with the Ancien Regime. Signs of delicacy and excess were suddenly seen not only as bourgeois, but actually grounds for decapitation by the newly invented guillotine. Conceived by a doctor, Monsieur Guillotine wanted to bring a humanitarian approach to decapitation. Previously, it might have taken multiple whacks with a dull axe to sever a head, but the guillotine was a clean death, relatively speaking. When the military jackets of the revolutionary sans-culottes sprouted high collars, it was no longer possible to keep the hair long and the tie at the back of the neck, so the tie of the cravat moved back to the front. Today, the term dandy is applied to any gentleman going to extreme trouble with his wardrobe, but the term was originally used to define the newly sober and refined gentleman of the early 1800s and differentiate him from the over-the-top excess of those Rococo fops. The most famous of the dandies was Beau Brummel, leader of young men focused on precision and simplicity in their understated tailoring. Despite being neither titled nor wealthy, Beau was such a fashion icon that dozens of young men came calling at his apartments every morning, like a group of young skater kids gathered to watch their leader show off his legendary tricks. Once his cravat was wound about his upturned collar, he would work the fabric down with his chin in a series of dips of the head, until it attained the correct number of folds for his desired appearance. 
This reportedly could take dozens of tries and last for up to six hours. Brummel's example inspired a tie-tying manual called Neckcloth Etania, which immediately became an international bestseller. Brummel insisted on having his snowy white cravats starched so heavily that they had the effect of an iron collar and were reportedly similar to wearing an orthopedic brace. It was said at the time that men's heads rested on their cravats as if on pillows, and sometimes small cushions were even incorporated. The difference in knots was up for a great deal of study, as how one chose the style of one's cravat and how well it was tied was a primary signifier of social class and inclinations. Succinctly put in a poem of the day, My neckcloth, of course, forms my principal care, for by that we criterions of elegance swear, and cost me each morning some hours of flurry to make it appear to be tied in a hurry. Brummel's close friend, the Prince of Wales, supposedly championed the stocks in part because his emphatic overeating had contributed to swollen neck glands that he wished to conceal. Though usually a long strip of linen, fitted versions were also available with easily fastened hooks and reinforced with whalebone or cardboard. The scrupulous whiteness was of paramount importance, which must have had valets swapping various stain removal secrets in back alleys like trading tips on horses. The linen cravat became silk, and through the end of the 19th century is when our modern ideas of neckwear really work themselves out. From the stock, three varieties branch off to form distinct styles of their own, the bow tie, the ascot, and the necktie. The bow tie was a smaller, more convenient version of the cravat, worn with a soft collared shirt instead of layered over a starched stock. After periods of extreme frivolity among artistes of the day, like Baudelaire and Oscar Wilde, the bow tie was shortened and subdued by the turn of the century. It became popular in the Industrial Revolution with the working class because it was less likely to become caught in machines. Rather counterintuitive to its popularity with the proletariat, along the way the bow tie also became an element of evening dress, both formal and semi-formal. Bow ties have gone in and out of popular fashion, but remain part of the uniform for formal wear and, for some reason, college professors. In addition to the more flamboyant bow, the upper middle class of Europe began to wear a loosely tied version for formal daytime events such as the Ascot Racecourse, which gives the Ascot its name. Ascots were seen throughout the 19th century held in place by jeweled stick pins. It limped along in popular fashion, coming back for brief vogues with Hollywood movie stars in the 1930s, but today they're mostly reserved for formal weddings or particularly daring dressers. Born alongside the Industrial Revolution, the necktie was thinner than an ascot but could be tied into many possible knots like the cravat. Especially popular was the four-in-hand, named after the knots used by drivers of four-horse carriages to hold the reins of the four horses together. Initially, little was seen of the tie beyond the knot, and the first models of neckties were only long enough to tuck into your waistcoat. Early neckties were cut on the straight of grain and therefore tricky to knot, so men depended on a wide range of pins, bars, and clips that were used to prevent slippage, whereas today these items are merely decorative. In 1924, New Yorker Jesse Langsdorf patented a new method for making ties, which is the same design we still use today. Called the resilient construction, it used a bias-cut, stiff wool interlining, which made ties easier to knot. They also looked cleaner when tied, were less likely to come unknotted, and permitted the tie to spring back into shape more easily when undone. With this new method of tie construction, coupled with the relaxing standards of daytime formality and the rise of sportswear during the 1920s, the length, width, and pattern of ties became new areas of distinction, particularly when worn without a vest. At this point, the modern necktie finally arrived. Neckwear had been made out of silk since the decline of linen stocks in the early 1800s, but during the rationing of World War II, ties were often made of rayon instead, and sometimes hand-painted due to limitations of materials. Decorated with anything from animals to sailboats to naked women, ties were one of the few places to find decoration in the male wardrobe. The canvases grew up to four and a half inches and were nicknamed belly warmers. 
The 1950s saw a return to ultra-conservatism and cautious understatement and the ties that followed throughout the 1960s were the skinniest version seen for decades. Of course, the narrow ties of that decade grew tiresome, and in the 1970s, ties got much more colorful and flamboyant and grew to nearly five inches wide, which necessitated very large knots. In the 1980s, regimental stripes became popular and ties got longer and narrower again. Aside from subtle changes in color, ties really haven't changed very much in the last 30 years. Today's ties are a standard 58 inches long and range from two to three and a half inches wide. Women may be free to follow the whims of fashion, but men are expected to conform to convention, and tradition for over a hundred years has dictated that in order to be fully properly dressed, you must wear this long, colorful silk ribbon around your neck tied in a knot under your chin. Ties don't keep you warm. Ties don't hold your clothes together. Ties really don't serve any practical purpose at all. And yet, there is perhaps no article of a man's attire about which he can be so passionate as his neckwear. Some men are daring and experimental with their ties. Some stick to the same knots their whole lives. And others just avoid ties at all costs. Whether a man is flamboyant or conservative about his neckwear, it has been a part of the standard male business dress for long enough that it is unlikely to be going anywhere anytime soon. And that is the origin of the necktie.